It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, noted author and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, noted author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Robert Moses, the nation's foremost city planner. Mr. Moses, of course, you've had many years <coughs> of experience in New York, both the city and state, as a planner of parkways and housing. I'm sure that our viewers tonight would like to hear you talk about some of the public planning problems, particular uh, traffic and housing and parkways. Now, sir, uh, how does the nation stand as regards road building? Are we falling behind on roads or are we keeping up? Oh, we're way behind. <coughs> We've been falling behind steadily for years and uh, now the <coughs> situation is more or less desperate. <clears throat> the fact is that unless we begin to, uh, unless we launch a, a new program, a much larger program, we're going to face a situation where we can't accommodate the output of cars. Is some of that due to the to the second war, sir, and to the money yes, we spent due there? To stoppage of uh, almost complete stoppage of road building during the Second World War, but it's been a steady. Uh, we've been falling behind steadily. Well, you say the situation is desperate now, sir. C could you estimate for our viewers how much money it would take uh, spent by the entire nation, states, cities, and country? How well, much would it would take for us to catch up? I would say between 45 and 55 billion dollars. Well, that isn't a figure. Those aren't figures taken out of the air. They represent the <coughs> adding up the uh, programs of the several states as approved by the federal government. How far is New York State, for instance, behind <coughs> the one that you are particularly concerned with? Well, our, our program uh, uh, involves an expenditure of about three billion, uh, close to three billion and a half dollars. Well, uh, how long do you think it'll take before we do have a modern road system to meet the needs of present-day traffic in the United States? Is there any way to hazard a guess on that? Well, if you mean how long would it take if we had enough money, I suppose mm -hmm. that we could uh, catch up within a period of uh, 8 to 12 years, not less than 8 years, because there's a limit to the amount of construction you can do in one year without simply stopping the wheels from moving at all. Well, it's been said that many of our roads, even the new ones, are going to pieces faster than new ones can be built. Is there any validity to that statement? No, I wouldn't say that. <coughs> What's I would say that if you spent somewhere between uh, <coughs> 45 and 55 billion dollars in a period of 8 to 12 years, and it's done intelligently under federal supervision, that uh, we'd be in pretty good shape, assuming that the output of cars remain just about what it I is see. today. Do you see any chance of that much money being spent? In that well, I don't see how we can escape doing it. I see. One of the ways we're trying to relieve this problem, of course, sir, is through building these great toll roads in the country, like the New York Thruway. Now, could you illustrate for us uh, some of the problems uh, using the New York th Thruway as an example? How much will that road cost, sir? I think it will cost somewhere in the neighborhood of <coughs> $750 million. And how is that financed? Is that the uh, that is financed hit? by the issuance of bonds, which, however, have the state credit back of them up to $500 million. Beyond that, they, uh, there won't be any state credit back of the bonds. Well, now, are these, are these toll roads uh, paying off? Are they, yes. uh, the people who invest their money get, them, get it back? Actually, they're, they're, they're paying better than most people expect. Mr. Moses, aren't they proving pretty dangerous, too, these superhighways and parkways? Uh, isn't the rate of accident on them higher than on other types of roads? No, the rate of accident is higher where the speed limit hasn't uh, uh, been held down to proper limits. And, uh, <coughs> of course, there are other factors such as climate and fog and snow and all that sort of thing. But uh, 
the people who built uh, the original uh, expressway, such as the uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, announced that there would be no speed limit. And then the accidents were simply terrific, and then they put a speed limit on that was too high, and gradually that's going to be brought down to some kind of reasonable limits. Of course, to build these roads, you have to move a lot of people's homes, don't you, sir? Yes, especially in urban communities, in uh, urban and suburban communities. That is one of the big problems. Could you give us any indication of how many homes will have to be moved in building the New York Thruway? Well, the New York Thruway <coughs> is, uh, I would say, three quarters of it is in open territory where there's no problem. The other one fourth, I wouldn't, <coughs> I wouldn't know how many. But in New York City, on the approaches, uh, to the uh, throughway system. There are really two throughways. One goes up to Buffalo and out west, and one goes to New England, goes east of New England through Westchester and Fairfield County, Connecticut. I would say that there are about, uh, on those two approaches, about uh, <coughs> 10,000 people. Well, uh, on the road question, sir, could you tell us, you're of course our national authority, what state has been most progressive in planning new highways? Well, it'd be hard to say. I, I would put California up way, way up on uh, near the top of the list. Well, moving on down to the next category in which you've had so much uh, experience, sir, the building of parks. Uh, how does our country compare with other countries in the world in building city parks? Well, I think that uh, they, the, uh, most of the country <coughs> abroad, <coughs> and I, I would not include South America in this particular uh, discussion, uh, inherited uh, uh, parks, uh, which were originally big estates, uh, and uh, <coughs> they have very fine, large parks, but inadequate playgrounds, inadequate local parks. We're much better off for local parks and playgrounds than they are. But our parks aren't adequate by any means in most of the cities of this country, no, I don't suppose, not. are they? they're not. Adequate in terms of what? In uh, room for children in to play? In terms of the number of people who have to be accommodated. Could you give us some illustrations, <coughs> sir, as far as New York City is concerned, uh, is, as to how parks have been developed? How many, how many do you have now, and how many did you have 10 years ago? Well, I'd rather take a little bit longer period, but <coughs> in, the, in the time since I've been connected with the city park department, I think we have about uh, between four and five times as many recreation facilities as we did uh, say, uh, 19 or 20 years ago. In your, in your thinking about parks, sir, it's said that our, we are becoming a nation of old people. In planning parks now, are you assuming that we'll have more and more older people? Well, we must assume that. All the figures show it. People are living longer, and they're spending more time outdoors, and they have more leisure, and they have pensions in one thing or another. That, and uh, the result is that we have to provide uh, more facilities of, of the passive recreation type for older people. Is that uh, Mr. Mean? Moses, uh, I'd like to get to this, this one question to me is very important because I'm personally mixed up in it. Now, as bad as our nation's highway system is, it seems to me that in New York and other cities that I've visited, that the traffic congestion within those cities is much worse. Is there anything that can be done to relieve this congestion? Oh, I think there are a great many things that can be done, but you've got to begin by assuming that that congestion is in the heart, in the old uh, centers of, of cities, and uh, doesn't necessarily extend throughout the cities or out into the suburbs. Well, what area in New York, for example? Well, in New York, I'd say the area from 125th Street down to the Battery on Manhattan Island, uh, possibly the uh, uh, old uh, Cadman Plaza section of Brooklyn, uh, uh, only Fordham, the Fordham Road section of the Bronx, uh, Jamaica and South Jamaica and Queens, and that's about all. Well, it still takes me uh, about 30 minutes to get across a few blocks of 44th or 45th Street in mid-Manhattan where I usually occupy my time. What can be done about that traffic congestion where it exists? I don't think you can ever meet that kind of <coughs> congestion wholly because the city's overbuilt there. There are too many big buildings, there are too many people coming in and out. That was bad planning that permitted that. The I think it can be solved measurably by uh, wholesale metering and using the, uh, the proceeds of metering to uh, build off-street facilities. The suggestion has been made to have midget taxi cabs. What about that? That's a minor thing. That goes along with regulatory matters such as 
of staggering the uh, <coughs> hours at which trucks can collect uh, uh, and deliver materials well, and uh, all that sort of thing. One of the remarkable things about your career, sir, is that I believe you call yourself an independent Republican, but uh, you've held office in both in New York State and New York City under both Democratic and Republican administrations. Now, sir, that we have a new Republican national administration, a conservative administration, do you think that there will be less federal money uh, spent on road building, for instance? No. I don't think there's any disposition on the part of the president or Congress to spend less money. They're going to spend more money on roads. They'll have to. As to housing, I, I wouldn't know. I think that they would, uh, uh, they would prefer to uh, subsidize uh, private construction rather than encourage strictly public construction. Well, sir, as a final question, you've had uh, a great deal of experience under great New York governors like Governor Roosevelt and Governor Dewey and as well as mayors and uh, you've been intimately associated with presidents. I'm sure that our viewers would like your opinion as to uh, which one of those men uh, you, you would count the ablest executive. Well, if I had to pick one person with whom I've had very close contact, among those with whom I've had very close contact, uh, I think I would unquestionably pick Al Smith. Well, that's, that's interesting. What, what did Smith have, sir, that the, uh, that the in excess that the others didn't have? Well, that's a long story, but I would say if I had to pick out one quality that he had that uh, distinguished him, uh, from other people. It was a quality of loyalty to the people who worked for him. Well, thank you very much for being with us this evening, sir. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Robert Moses, the nation's foremost city planner. To the connoisseur, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Discriminating men and women appreciate the elegance of a Longines watch, the solid good taste of its styling, the jewel-like finish of its case, and equally, its greater accuracy, its faithfulness as a timepiece. Now the high opinion of Longines watches is reflected also in the medals, prizes, and honors which Longines watches have won at World's Fairs and in Observatory Accuracy Contests. Yes, to the connoisseur throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines. Distinguished alike for elegance and excellence and for accuracy and long life. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty. <coughs> Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Sundays, it's Ed Sullivan's Toast of the Town on the CBS Television Network.